Welcome to yet another fresh episode of Business Roundup. My name is Wadulo Mark Arnold. This week, we shall be taking you through a couple of stories ranging from the Joseph Mary Mubiru Memorial Lecture, which focused on the innovations in the financial sector. And then also, journalists are going to be taking the lead in promoting conservation. We shall also take a look at that. And I'm sure you've also heard about the Uganda Airlines being tested on the runway in Canada. These and more in this episode. Stay tuned, because it's time for business. In our first story, this year's annual Joseph Mary Mubiru Memorial Lecture was held under the theme, the role of financial innovation and inclusion in scaling up growth in Uganda. Now among the major acknowledgements at the lecture, East Africa was credited for being one of the leading global trendsetters of a unique product in the financial sector, mobile money. Joseph Mary Mubiru was the first governor of Bank of Uganda who is credited for establishing a strong foundational structure that the bank carries till date. The late Joseph Mubiru's liberation struggle was in the financial sector, whose performance and moral compass he sought to improve and uphold. Despite being a global trendsetter in the mobile financial services, this year's lecture highlighted the need for Uganda to foster innovations and inclusion in the financial sector using the six C's model. The six C's are competition, coordination, collaboration, consumer protection, commitment, and communication. It's not very often our part of the world leads in something, but definitely in terms of the area of mobile money and payment systems that the whole world now has embraced uh, is something we should definitely be proud of. The coexistence of various financial innovations in Uganda today holds the potential to drive the economy towards much bigger opportunities. I think the, the biggest will be uh, increases, increasing access to credit but also on increasing what we call financial inclusion. That means having as many people as possible, Ugandans, into the formal financial sector. So when money is out of people's houses, in underbeds and in pots, and is into the economy, into the system, then it's utilized by those that are doing productive things. For 26 years now, the Joseph Mary Mubiru Lecture has been a platform to trigger debates that attempt to improve the state of financial challenges in Uganda. For UBC Business, Wadulo Mark Arnold. Players in the pension sector have been urged to design customer-centric products and also conduct financial literacy programs in order to encourage the population to save more. Now, increased savings is critical for financial security in retirement, says Martin Subuga, the chief executive officer of Ubra. Uganda's pension sector covers only about 2 million of the population, which is less than 10% of the 40 million strong population. According to the regulator, Uganda Retirements and Benefits Regulatory Authority, UBRA, the sector's portfolio is currently growing at over 20% per annum, which is good news but not satisfactory. We are also trying to match this evolving sector seriously. And you're looking at a number of uh, strategic interventions. We want to look at uh, amending our laws. You also think of uh, working closely with other sector players in terms of adding value and creating a much more enabling environment for all sector players. The steady growth of the pension sector has attracted a new pension administrator and wealth. Licensed as a pension administrator in Kenya and Uganda, Enworth joins nine other licensed pension administrators. Those changes in life, we have to plan for them. They will have financial implications on us. And we require to plan ahead of time. Like they say, if you fail to plan, you are planning to fail. People don't need sympathy or pity. What they need are creative solutions to address their challenges. And I believe 
with passion, we are able to overcome all kinds of challenges. Where there are challenges, we see opportunities because we are driven by a sense of greater good. For optimistic of a quick growth and penetration due to Uganda's rosy economic growth projection, they are reminded of the poor savings culture the country is grappling with. According to Richard Birugaba, the Managing Director, National Social Security Fund, to survive in Uganda's complex pension sector, innovation and customer-centric products is critical. Only 20% of the people who save with us have any other form of other saving apart from NSSF, which means that 80% don't have any other form of saving, which is an indication that Ugandans just don't like saving, and they will only save if they are forced to save, which is what NSF does. So, a little bit of wanting you to un understand the market. Notably, the 2016 World Bank World Development Indicators report noted that Uganda save a meager 5% of their monthly earnings. Inadequate savings ultimately raises fears of a difficult retirement period for majority of Uganda's population, analysts warn. Dennis Igoa for UBC Business. Uganda is ready to adopt new technologies that have been tried and tested elsewhere and proved transformative, says Vincent Bajire, the permanent secretary for the Ministry of ICT. He promised government support to investors in the technology space while gracing over the interministerial summit on Earth observation in Africa, held in Kampala. At a time when new technologies are transforming service delivery and the people's way of life globally, Uganda cannot afford to lag behind. When we are talking ICT and how it impacts on the economy, we are primarily looking at, again, two major areas. We are looking at, one, how do we use and harness technology to be competitive as a country? And that is to the extent of uh, efficiency, the extent of effectiveness in the delivery of services to the citizens that we as government officials serve. This was at the Interministerial Summit on Earth Observation in Africa at the Kampala Serena Hotel, organized by Catalyst, a software company with subsidiaries in Austria, Romania and Germany. The meeting sought to showcase new technologies developed by Catalyst and their relevance to Uganda. In 2018, Catalyst founded its African subsidiary in Kampala with an aim of bringing knowledge and experience in software development primarily in the earth observation domain. So with uh, uh, agriculture, we can also determine the rate of humidity uh, in soil using uh, sensing uh, uh, technology. And in this, we can also determine the pH of uh, a particular soil and uh, having said that, here we can decide, uh, one can determine which products, sorry, which crops grow where. So instead of uh, forcing oneself to grow matoke in an area where it doesn't uh, really have to be grown in the first place. The geostatistical analysis of EO data is seen as critical for Uganda since it can help in analyzing the earth's water regime as well as applications in forestry and agriculture. So we see catalysts coming in to support us in that field of really helping us institutionalize this monitoring of our forests. And we, we know they have very good technologies. You know, one of the challenges we have as developing countries is the technology. We do not have the right technology to really do the monitoring, to do the assessment, to do the forest inventory. So we see catalysts coming in in that aspect to work with us. Denis Igoa in Charlotte Amuge for UBC News. Airtel Uganda recently declared its unrivaled 4G internet presence across the country. In an exclusive interview with the Business Roundup, the Airtel Managing Director, VG Somaseka, gives an insight into the new development and the benefits of 4G to the subscribers. You're the first telco to do it in Uganda. How does it make you feel? You're the first telco to do 4G to have a nationwide or countrywide 4G uh, that is, that's connection. That's a very, very good question. I must tell you, this is, uh, you know, Atel has a very different mindset. I think whatever we do, we call Uganda first. 
When we say Uganda first, I think it translates into investment and innovation. Yeah. And telecom, you can't do anything until you invest. I think what we have done is saying, let's bring the best technology. You know, the government of Uganda announced a national broadband policy approved by the cabinet as recent as September. But we started our 4G migration earlier than that. And we were able to say, hey, here is a broadband policy which says, why can't you make 4G countrywide? We said, we'll take on that opportunity, responsibility, and make it good. So it's a long-term view. It's an investment ahead of the curve. I think the investment we're making today is not going to be seeing rewards and any time now, I think it will take maybe two, three, four years before we see this return uh, coming on this investment. So um, regarding the consumption of data, of course, there's always been a, co a concern from subscribers that they sometimes uh, subscribe for 100 MBs or 300 MBs, then it gets done very fast, it gets finished and they keep on complaining. So with 4G, uh, what does this mean to them? Is it a faster internet and also faster consumption of data? That is very, very good question. I think it's important to uh, set expectations and uh, maybe, uh, you know, educate through this conversation. Yes. When you get faster internet, what happens? Now let's take real life. Uh, you're on a WhatsApp group and you got a video. The moment you touch that video, the, video, yes. the 4G is going to download it fast. fast yeah. Now let's say, you may or may not have seen that three minute video, but it is going to ensure you download quickly. The moment you download, your data is going to be used. Yes. So what I really think, we are now saying, if you have to download anything, download it faster, and then repetitive usage and consumption becomes less. There's no buffering. Mm -hmm. Now, we are trying to ensure that we come clean and straight to our consumers, okay. which is why we have the most popular bundles. And I think uh, a, a, a popular bundle is 1,000 1, shillings, 100 MB, 5,000 shillings, 1 GB. Then you have this Friday, uh, freaky Friday offers. All this is to ensure that use your internet comfortably. Mm -hmm. In fact, the way we see it is internet is a consumption product. Yes. It is not a product just by possession. A phone is by possession. You can, I've got a phone and I'm just happy with my phone. But internet is a consumption product, and we are trying to make consumption easy. So network is widely available, products are extremely affordable. Your customers should feel comfortable with 4G, and that's why I encourage MiFi. So uh, getting back to the East African region, I very well know that Oper uh, Airtel operates in Uganda as well as in Kenya. So for your subscribers, you know, we tend to cross, like me, I travel a lot across to Kenya and back. I would, I would like to know, uh, where does this place me? If I'm to travel from here, because I'm sure, sure often when I cross to Kenya, uh, I realize that uh, I have to get on to, to, to Rome, then data is consumed very fast, yet I'm still on the same network. So is there anything you, can you be assured probably uh, customers that uh, we are going to be running on the same platform, uh, which is obviously uh, affordable? Another insightful question. Uh, Atel operates across East Africa region. So your uh, Atel Uganda, Kenya, Tanzania, Rwanda, I think we are covered everywhere. So first and foremost, when you use an Atel SIM and you cross the border, uh, your phone and the SIM card is going to work across the border. That's number one. It's great for voice. So you're never going to miss a call. You're never going to miss an SMS. Mm -hmm. But I must say, uh, data tariffs are country-led. Because when you cross to Kenya, you move from Uganda shillings to Kenyan shillings. Yes. And likewise in every other country. Yes. So the, the currency, the pricing, the data bundle are country specific. Mm -hmm. What we want to recommend to our customers, when you're data roaming, try and use Wi-Fi. Okay. Use data roaming, and we are soon going to be launching a data roaming bundles, where an Atel customer is saying, I, I carry a data roaming bundle mm -hmm. from Uganda. I go to Kenya over the weekend and I come back. Yeah. So I think this is one of the things our customers can expect. Soon we'll be announcing data roaming bundle where you can carry your roaming bundle from Uganda into any one of these neighboring countries. The media should take the lead in promoting conservation, says Lilia Jarova, the outgoing executive director of Ngamba Island Conservation Trust. Media's involvement in tourism and conservation is expected to attract more tourists to Uganda and encourage locals to value Uganda's rich and diverse flora and fauna.
was injured in a fight, you can see. Chibale National Park has more chimpanzees than any other conservation area in the world. Besides the primates, the park's flora and fauna are simply amazing. Over the years, the visitors' numbers to Chibale have grown exponentially, which is good news for Uganda's tourism industry. Over 90% of the visitor numbers we receive here are foreign non-residents. We've had many Ugandans to come, and this is one of the efforts also. It is on this background that the Chimpanzee Trust, under the stewardship of Lilia Jarova, the outgoing executive director Ngamba Island Conservation Trust, took a selected group of local journalists to Chiwale National Park. The, medias have, the media has not been too involved, deeply involved to understand the subject of conservation. And that is what we think that the conservation media camp would be able to address get the media deeply involved in what is going on in understanding conservation. And uh, I believe personally that that has been the missing link. The third edition of the Conservation Media Camp was enhancing journalists' knowledge of how the chimps live in the wild. With more journalists getting acquainted to nature and conservation, it is expected to have a ripple effect in attracting more tourists to Uganda, enhancing the industry's visibility, reduce human wildlife conflict, as well as promote conservation. As a number, we thought we needed to turn conservation into a conversation. And uh, we have had three of them. We started with number in June, we had in Hoima. But we go out there with the flagship species, which is the chimpanzees, to understand that the biggest challenge of these chimpanzees facing the chimpanzees is the human, you know, is the biggest threat. So we want to create a voice for the chimpanzees because they are the voiceless. It's high time the journalists in Uganda uh, put in more effort into their travel environment and uh, tourism sector because tourism, environment are everything from if we don't have them, we can't live. It's just a real experience that you you see it on TV, you see it on, online, but to experience in real life, it's it's really good. Also as a journalist, because as a journalist, normally you write about it, but you don't know the real experience. And if you're here, you, you, you can smell them, you can hear the sound. It's just, it's very cool. And I think it's very needed to, to make your story complete. In the wild, chimps roam and for the tourists to see them it takes hours of tracking and several kilometers of walking in the deep tropical forest. However it's a moment to cherish for a lifetime when one comes across Moman's closest relative in the jungle of Chibale. We are deep in the jungle of the primate capital of the world with over 1,450 chimpanzees. Chibale National Park is the ideal chimp tracking destination in the world. Dennis Igoa for UBC News in Chibari. It is estimated that Uganda's literary industry is valued at 227 billion shillings, of which only about 8.2% of this value is what is being exploited. This is due to the increase in book piracy in the country, says Ismail Molindwa, the acting director for basic secondary education at the Ministry of Education and Sports. The literary industry in Uganda is growing fast, and this is in response to the liberalization of the education sector. However, the sector still grapples with book piracy, which is stifling the progress in the literary field. Book piracy undermines the core business of scholarship, which is the creation and dissemination of knowledge. Agent solutions must be found to protect intellectual property rights and in turn guarantee quality educational textbooks in our institutions of learning and the hands of our learners. It is believed that the pirates make more money than the genuine publishers. Because if you're costing your book at let's say 20,000 shillings, somebody who is just photocopying at the back of their house does not have rent to pay, has gotten a very cheap machine and is definitely going to undercut you when they sell the book at 5,000 shillings. So you do the math. That's less than half the price you're selling the books. It is with this challenge that the publishing industry in Uganda has been called upon to find innovative ways to price and advertise their books. Schools, the main source of revenue to the illegal book dealers, are also cautioned against supporting the vice. Some of the publishers, especially those that are not indigenous, have had to leave our market 
You see, if you don't sell to government, maybe for three, five years, um, and uh, you're not doing well on the open market because you're also competing with cheaper versions eh, of your book, you can't meet your overheads. So the only thing that you have to do is close. We have had a challenge where people will squeeze brochure from anywhere. And that has created problems for us because they procure from anywhere, procure books which we have not vetted. Yeah, we need to look at the books and agree on the content. We have NCDC, National Cultural Development Center, is mandated to look at the content eh, of what is it. But you find everything comes in our, in our schools. At the end of the day, the children fail. Copyright in Uganda is protected for the lifetime of the author and 50 years after his or her death. Charlotte Amuge, UBC News. On the international scene, Somalia authorities have assured Kenya that the disputed oil blocks will not be auctioned. The blocks are in the disputed maritime region between both nations. This comes after Kenya recalled its ambassador and expelled the Somali envoy to Kenya. A diplomatic standoff between Somalia and Kenya has emerged over a maritime dispute. Nairobi has accused Mogadishu of auctioning oil and gas blocks in a disputed territory in the Indian Ocean, a move Mogadishu has denied in a statement released by the Foreign Ministry. Diplomatic tension between the two countries escalated over the weekend after Kenya recalled its ambassador to Somalia and ordered the Somali top diplomat in Nairobi out of its country. Kenyan officials argue that Somalia offered several oil blocks in its territory to external bidders at a recently concluded conference in London. The summons is a consequence of a most regretful and egregious decision by the government of Somalia to auction off oil and gas blocks in Kenya's maritime territorial area that borders Somalia. This unparalleled affront and illegal grab grab at the resources of Kenya will not go unanswered and it is tantamount to an act of aggression against the people of Kenya and their resources. Somalia has however moved to assure its neighbor that it will not take any unilateral activities in the region before the judgment of the court. Legal teams from both countries are now expected to avail themselves for an oral hearing at the International Court of Justice later in September. Experts now say that Kenya is worried about the possible outcome of the court case. <laughs> The latest statements coming out of Kenya reveals that Nairobi is worried about the possible outcome of the court case in The Hague. It is a preemptive move aimed at forcing Somalia to resolve the issue through dialogue and abandon the court case at the International Court of Justice. Somali officials have also criticized the move to expel its envoy to Kenya without prior consultation. Somalia says it shares a solid bond with the East African nation. The relationship between Somalia and Kenya is a real one, it's a solid one, and to make it clear our intention of uh, even taking the, uh, the relationship and the cooperation between the two countries to another level. Mogadishu hopes to revive its hydrocarbon sector and is set to announce first round of bidding on offshore acreages in 206 blocks, mainly in southern Somalia, as it seeks to revive its economy. Meanwhile, opposition lawmakers have criticized the recently concluded London conference and called for transparency in the bidding process. Once the bidding is done, economists say Somalia will join ranks with oil and gas producing nations of the world. Abdulaziz Bilal, CGTN, Mogadishu, Somalia. Ugandan taxpayers parted with a huge chunk of money towards purchase of iPads for members of parliament. We remain concerned that we, even with that facility, we still see a lot of hard copy printing uh, in parliament when you look at the respective budget allocations and would invite parliament and government in general to going uh, digital technology and uh, adopting some of these iPad facilities and then lessening the, the cost, the budget uh, on the side of, uh, of, of photocopying.
Famous for mountain hiking, Renzori National Park is located at the border between Western Uganda and Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo. However, for those planning to hike the Renzori's, fitness is paramount. Enjoy the mountains of the moon in our sounds of business. Each and every one of us is a mirror to our society because of the pictures you can take and showcase to the world. But here is what I urge you to do. Once you have your phone out there, strive to take pictures that market your country as opposed to tainting the image of Uganda. My name is Wadilo Mark Arnold. I'm the Matima Nye. It's goodbye. <laughs>